it's November, it's freezing, and we're just starting work here on the conservation of the Mid-Georgian building at the back of 80 Norman Key Upper. Let's take a look inside. Like many of Dublin street buildings behind the facade is a layer cake of alterations that have taken place over the years, including this very atmospheric staircase that was put in ingeniously within the 18th century volume of the building just after 1900. And you can see it actually soars all the way up through the building, up to the top floor. And it's built of pine with TNG walls. And then the real surprise is this wonderful mid 18th century cornice, which is, looks like it's been painted every year since it was built. And this is really the star of the show in a way. And what we're currently looking at and working on, uh, because inside here we have, do not enter, we can enter on this occasion. We have Andrew Smith from Smith & Henderson Stucker Doors. Hi Andrew. Hello, how are you? Working on bringing this cornice back to life. And what's really heartening here, Andrew, isn't it, for the most part, uh, it's actually brute force or delicate brute force that's it's, that's working yeah, to remove the paint. Mechanical paint removal, as it's called, yeah. to resorting to chemicals. So you try to remove as much as you can with small tools, so you're not intervening too much in the detail and removing the paint. The whole purpose of removing the paint, as you can see, the detail here has been revealed and you can see the detail has been lost under layers and layers and layers, centuries of paint. So that's what we're doing, revealing the uh, detailing for its both aesthetic and its function in the room. How would you describe this style of cornice? Well, this style of cornice is kind of, it is uh, sort of mid 18th century. It's a very refined, it's kind of the whole layer of the cornice, the way it's been set out for, it's for the Rococo style. But the actual, it's following the pattern of the Rococo style, but its detail is very, very refined and very neoclassical, which is heartening, which is uh, making the appearance of neoclassicism coming into, uh, in, in this period, a changeover from the more robust Rococo style to the uh, more freehand work to a more refined work of the neoclassical style that typified from the late 18th century. Uh, we still have remnants of mid 18th century deeds, so this waterleaf pattern in this Gadruni at the base. This would be all changing. There'd be more prescribed classical order of cornices and the frieze would be more straight if there's a frieze or a flat. The curve of Rococo cornice goes out of fashion at this time. Yeah. So this is kind of the last gasp of um, the Rococo style. But interestingly, all of it is done in situ as well. Most people think it's all cast detail. No, it's all modelled in situ. All the detail here is modelled in situ as well. And the water leaf pattern is all modelled in situ. And they continued on right into the early 19th century. A lot of the decorative ceilings, freezer corners are done in situ. There is some casting in the 1770s, but mostly it's freehand work. So it's a really sophisticated, skilled... It is a highly sophisticated skill. And, and uh, the most interesting thing is the amount of decorative plaster, in spite of years and years of neglect and demolition in this city, is the amount of decorative plaster per square acre is quite incredible compared to most other European cities. I mean, there is just as equally fine decorative plaster around all over Europe, mostly in much grander houses, whereas here is just a very small average domestic house and you have this very fine uh, cornice in it. That's the thing, we're on a back street off the Keys, yeah. and yet we have something of this quality. Yeah, yes. Exactly, this quality, and it is a very high quality as well. I mean, it is equal to anything in Europe, so it is. So we're, what we're looking at right now is this, what is in fact the centerpiece of the room. That's right, we're coming to the centerpiece of the long side of the room, it's on the west wall, is that it's demarcated with either an urn or a, or a basket of flowers or whatever. So we're approaching to that as we remove the paint. This is the first layer of the paint on the uh, uh, on the plasterwork. And, and of course, th this is in its own right a layer cake of, of, of history is it, that, that you are removing. But we, ha we have undertaken paint analysis. That's uh, correct. Before this, before it's so we have a record. So what? Oops. There's something's gone. So water's coming. This kind of dark brown stuff is known as case and band distemper. And in this case, I'm lucky on this side of the wall, it comes off relatively easy. But in some cases, it's nearly impossible to remove. It's like trying to remove concrete. So because a certain amount of moisture has come through over the years in the background, it has weakened it. And it's much more easier to remove. 
because some cases you'll find it and it just will not budge. It's a, a terrible amount of hard work in it trying to remove it. And originally in, when this was finished in the 18th century, 18th century in 1760, or perhaps even as late as 1770, but stylistically, yes. uh, I presume it would have been finished in a white or an off-white I'd say it would have been finished in an off-white uh, distemper, and that would have been basically chalk, crushed chalk and animal glue, and it was painted on, and then they could then, over the years then, if they came to redecorate, they'd wash it off and then reapply it and uh, that's what you had to do and I think what happened in the 19th century they invented a, a case and band of stamper which is the same sort of product of animal glue and uh, water and whiting but they added a case and bound product which is a, basically a milk product to the actual um, plaster or to the paint and that would have made it more more like an early emulsion and it, of course it's if it's really good stuff it's impervious to any penetration so it stopped they didn't have to wash the corners down anymore for subsequent layers of paint yes but the trouble is you ended up building up more and more layers of case and band of which just became very very difficult to remove this unfortunately because of water ingress otherwise it's like on the uh, east wall i had to do an awful lot of hard work just chipping away slowly at it and from what we were looking at just a few minutes ago, it, there seems to be a different hand uh, between this east well, wall and the west. Well, certainly there's a different style in all the uh, detail you've got. Uh, on that side, you've got an account that was slightly different to the mirror image on this side. And you also have uh, olive leaves and... Uh, I can't remember. Olive leaves and ivy leaves there entwining with each other. And on this side of the wall, you've got olive leaves and vines. And what we're particularly lo looking forward to is the fact that so much of the cornice was chopped out on the north wall here in the, well, from what we can make out there in 1965, from uh, the newspaper yeah. uh, that Andrew's uh, discovered, stuffed into stuffed in here, uh, in, into the hole where the tie bar went through. So bang on 1965, just when we thought. Um, so the reinstatement of the, of the cornice, which will be hand run and then hand modelled, uh, uh, is will be the next phase uh, once the this cornice has been both stripped and then consolidated yeah, and consolidated and the repair is done on it as well. Well, thanks, Andrew, for okay, that. Not at all. My pleasure. The cornice can tell us something about what this building originally looked like. Nowadays, there's an 1840 shop front across the ground floor, but when the building was finished in the mid 18th century. We found good evidence that there was originally three sash windows overlooking the street at a higher level than the current shop front. And these windows would have lit a posh parlour or a back drawing room, which in turn tied into the previous building that stood on the site of 80 Norman Quay before it was rebuilt in 1843. And these three windows correspond exactly with the position of the cornice where it still survives inside today. So the wider aim of the conservation of the inside of this building over the next year will be to respect these later layers of alteration and to showcase how the building has evolved over time. Check in soon for another update.